This episode is brought to you by Squarespace. Build it beautiful. Bigfoot, mysterious forest ape, reported primarily in the Pacific Northwest of the United States, but the footprints of this legend reach around the world. Thousands of minds, countless websites, podcasts, and even YouTube channels dedicated to searching for and examining the evidence for Bigfoot. Bigfoot is one of many so-called cryptids, creatures whose existence has been suggested by folklore, but remain, as the ancient Greeks would say, cryptos, or hidden. Tales of monsters and ogres and wild men are as old as stories, but the line between legend and science hasn't always been crystal clear. The bestiaries of ancient naturalists describe men with the heads of dogs and hairy, mouthless beasts that only smelled flowers. But that was then. Why do people still search for these mysterious creatures? Well, Earth is a big place, and the possibility of finding a new animal species, while small, is real. In 2013, scientists discovered the Olinguito, a raccoon-sized creature that lives in the forests of South America. The Okapi, giant panda, the Komodo dragon, even the mountain gorilla were all discovered, at least in part, thanks to folklore. Even fossil bones like those of Gigantopithecus tell us that as recently as 100,000 years ago, nine-foot-tall apes walked alongside our human ancestors. The footprints of Bigfoot lead to British Columbia, where legends of Sasquatch have long circulated among the native peoples. The three pillars that helped build the Bigfoot legend started in 1957, when the town of Harrison Hot Springs announced a Sasquatch hunt. A man named William Rowe came forward with an account two years earlier of an encounter with a six-foot-tall human-like ape. During the next year, newspapers reported numerous footprints at construction sites run by a man named Raymond Wallace. Sasquatch became Bigfoot, and a consistent image began to take shape. The third pillar, when Bigfoot hit its stride, was starring in a famous 1967 film. Of course, there are three tiny problems with these. It seems no one actually remembers meeting William Rowe. And when Ray Wallace died in 2002, his family admitted that the footprints had all been a hoax. Now, now, the famous film shows something, although when it's stabilized, I'm definitely feeling more of a guy in an ape suit vibe. Based on this, you'd think the story would end here, but it doesn't, and that's what makes Bigfoot so interesting. It continues to be a global myth. Eyewitness accounts, tours, television programs continue to roll on. Frank J. Sillaway once said, anecdotes do not make a science. 10 anecdotes are no better than one, and 100 anecdotes are no better than 10. One of the first rules of science is that because I said so doesn't make very good proof. Our brains are easy to fool. Eyewitness accounts simply aren't enough to determine if Bigfoot visited the library before track practice or called Jay from the Best Buy parking lot and somehow ended up in these woods. Let's cut into this with Occam's razor. When presented with multiple hypotheses, pick the one with the fewest assumptions. If a pair of underwear goes missing in the laundry, it is possible that laundry gnomes swiped it as part of some fairy tale profit-making scheme. But a much simpler answer, one with far fewer assumptions, is that it's just hiding in the bottom of the clothes hamper. And indeed, when we model the ecological range of Bigfoot based on reported sightings and behavior, we get a map that looks like this disturbingly similar to the American black bear. The hypothesis with fewer assumptions looks a lot like this. That is a bipedal bear. What about physical evidence? Many people have claimed to have such evidence for Bigfoot. I'm talking about hair. Enhance. Enhance. When scientists recently analyzed 30 supposed Bigfoot and Yeti hair samples, every single DNA sequence matched that of a known mammal. So, does all of this prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that Bigfoot doesn't exist? Unfortunately, that may be impossible to prove. 
The absence of evidence isn't the same as evidence of absence. Let's say you claim you've got a pink dragon living in your garage. This is easily verifiable. Just take me out to the garage because I would like to see this dragon. But you forgot to tell me that your dragon is invisible. Well, that's fine. Let's just sprinkle some flour on the floor and we can catch its footprints. Ah. It turns out that your shy pink invisible dragon can also float. Okay, well, let me just put on these infrared goggles to which you say your dragon is actually capable of interdimensional teleportation, at which point I'm leaving because this is kind of getting ridiculous. This example was famously used by Carl Sagan in his book, The Demon Haunted World, to make the point that claims which cannot be tested are just bad claims. Philosopher of science, Karl Popper went even further if a claim can't be proven false, it's not science, it's pseudoscience. In science, we go looking for things that can falsify our claims. The tricky part of this is that scientific claims are never completely proven true. They only continue to not be proven false. But this doesn't make science weak. If anything, it makes it stronger. This is why we can never completely disprove the claim that Bigfoot is real. It's just not the right question for science. A good scientific theory would be that there is not a huge hairy primate roaming the forests of North America, that there's not an aquatic beast in a Scottish lake that's been completely landlocked since the end of the last ice age, because all it would take to prove that idea false is to find one. Stay curious. This episode of It's Okay to Be Smart was brought to you by Squarespace. It's an easy tool to build a website, a blog, or an online store. They have custom templates, a user-friendly interface, and 24-7 customer support. If you want to try Squarespace for yourself, you can go to squarespace.com slash it's okay to be smart for a special offer. Squarespace, build it beautiful. If you're as excited about X-Files coming back as we are, follow me on over to Idea Channel. Mike takes a look at why the X-Files captured or abducted so much of our imagination and attention. Why is it always aliens? A couple great books went into making this episode. Carl Sagan's A Demon Haunted World and Abominable Science by Donald Prothrow and Daniel Loxton. You'll find links to both of those down in the description.